to my heart. Um, I'm an electronic musician and I also have a background in engineering and robotics. And this is sort of uniting some of those ideas, but from the archives. So if you want to talk about the origins of today's music, it depends how far back you want to go. And the received wisdom, for example, is that the recording age began with the Edison phonograph, 1877, the first machine to record and play back sounds. But actually, we've been recording for centuries before that, not using machines, but birds. So, um, wonderful story. Here, here's a painting by Chardin um, in the 18th century. And uh, this woman is playing a tune to her caged birds. And she's playing it on this machine here, a serenette, a little portative organ that made little high-pitched, birdie-pitched sounds. And it could play all the fashionable tunes of the day, a gavotte or a minuet or whatever. And she could equally have been doing that on a little flute or a flageolet. And uh, what she'd do every day, she'd, every morning, she'd take the cover off the bird, play the tune, and give the bird some kind of juicy worm or whatever. And then when her friends came round, instead of putting on the stereo, she'd take the cover off and the bird would sing the tune. And this persisted until the phonograph got into people's homes. This was still being done in the late 19th century. Um, and of course, rather than going and buying your CDs or your downloads, um, you could choose to buy fashionable melodies in these bird training books which were where the songs were actually pitched for the bird in question. These were called the bird fanciers delights. So I love that. There's an example of a hugely, hugely, uh, before the electric age, uh, sort of, um, and, you know, ancestor of what we do now. And of course the word record actually comes from bird training because birds are said to record when they've learned to memorise and play back their song. Could you buy a pre-recorded bird? You could actually, you could buy a pre-recorded bird. Actually, yes, you could in the market. And they, they had a premium, as did particular types of birds. And, the, and of course, the one that everybody wanted was the nightingale, because it had a beautiful song. It was very hard to look after, because um, it, it, it needed soft, live food. And there was a big, big deal trying to make a bird that had the roughiness of a canary with the sort of song power of a nightingale. So it's a bit like one of these sort of, you know, classic engineering problems. And they never quite got there. You know. But then, thankfully, Edison came along. Um, yes, and um, it's wonderful when you find these strange little examples of attributes of what you think are like today's powerful, you know, amplified music appearing in the pre-electric age. I mean great big bass speaker stacks with visceral trouser flapping bass. Um, they're a descendant of what goes on in cathedrals. <coughs> it's been going on in, complete, in cathedrals since the time of Bach, maybe earlier. Now this is Atlantic City Hall. These men are at the bottom of the bass organ pipe, the lowest one, which is 64 feet long. It makes sound at 8 hertz. Now I, I wouldn't even call that sound, I'd call that infrasound. It sounds so deep, it's on the cusp of perception, and you feel it rather than hear it. And, and people went to get the wow factor in the same way that they'll go to a Sun concert now and get the wow factor. And it was what created the sense of awe. And so I love that. I love that again. Um, technology uh, in the pre-electric age, sort of pre-echo of what we do now. Uh, the person I showed earlier um, is a hero of mine, Daphne Oren. And here she is, uh, she was the co-founder of the Radiophonic Workshop, among many other things, brilliant composer. And here she is with her Aramix machine, which was a sort of optical synthesizer come sequencer, which, which she invented. And um, there are many reasons why that is a hero. But it hasn't escaped my notice that people like Oram and Delia Derbyshire stand out from the crowd because, of course, they were female. And the sort of received wisdom is that uh, somehow women had only a marginal role in the history of electronic music and in the history of dance music um, that we have today. And again, you could say, well, why is that? And you could, same thing again, depends how far back you want to go. I would go back to St. Paul, who said these terrible words. Um, that means, in ecclesia. Do anybody want to translate that? Uh, women be silent in church. So, in the, um, and this is where it all started, basically. Uh, um, women were sort of pushed out of making noises, uh, musical noises in church, because it was considered um, 
undignified in some way and might sort of, you know, rough, ruffle too many feathers. So women were prevented from that early, early time, and this persisted way, way into the sort of 19th century from making as much musical expression as men. But even then, some wonderful things happened. Um, because, um, and I think this is about being a cyborg fist. I think that what I'm about to tell you is about how people embrace cyborg technology to well, break down these awful gender uh, binaries. And of course, that was the invention, and I use the word advisedly invention, of the castrato. So the castrato was a male voice that could be used in church and in other public places, but the, the, the man in question was castrated, this is the technology of the time, the surgeon's knife, was castrated um, around puberty and developed into this strange sort of big body type with incredibly wide vocal range, massive soprano range as well as sort of lower range. And these were cyborgs, they were a combination of human and technology. And I don't think you could say they were necessarily male or female when you think about <coughs> musically. Their voice was something other and it was something transcendent and you know, cruel as it was, it was meant to be a, an absolutely exquisite sound. And I love that story. And um, so I'm always interested in stories that subvert some of the ideas that are in circulation about men, women, and music technology. And also stories where um, electrical music has pre-electric origins. And this is one of my favorites, and uh, it sort of unites them all. And I don't know quite where to start, but usually when I tell the story, and I'm going to do it today because I think we'll like some of the pictures. Um, I'm going to start with this, and it was in the November 1960 edition of Popular Mechanics magazine. <coughs> and it was the Sideman, essentially the world's first commercial drum machine. And uh, as you can see, what you do is you sort of play like this as you're an organ player, and then you can turn to the side and <coughs> use your Sideman to get your drums on. But actually a Sideman was a general term in use for sort of session musicians who come in and supply sound really quickly. Um, it's a wonderful machine, it's electromechanical. This is what you get on the top, all your different rhythms, your tango, your cha cha cha, and all that. And this is what it looks like under the lid. So it's got a speaker here, um, the amps. This is the important bit, the rotor selector. And the rotor selector relates to this wonderful piece of kit here, which was the wheel. So what would happen? Oh. The wheel. So what would happen is um, there were brushes on here that would make contact with these and the rotor would switch different brushes on and off and it just sweep round and click and pop, you know, do sort of little resonant uh, type sounds as well as sort of noise clicks. And, um, and then you could just change the speed of an idle, um, use an idle wheel to change the speed of the rotor and that's how you got your different speeds. And, you know, and it was sold as this thing that enabled anybody to have a full rhythm section at your side, which of course it did which was a great thing if you were a keyboard player because you no longer needed to rely on a drummer and you no longer needed to split the fee with the drummer. But it was a terrible thing for drummers, obviously. <laughs> so, so they went on the attack and they got some very important people working with them. Uh, none more important than the UK Musicians Union who did something very clever. They pointed out the obvious weakness in this sideman, which was that it was perfect. It produced absolutely perfectly metric beats. It didn't have any of the sort of rubato, any of the sort of rhythmic ebb and flow of a human drummer. And they called it a robot, a stilted machine, and they said, don't fall for it. They didn't think it was any good. They said it could only compete with the most basic drummer, but um, it, it meant that the most sort of the rookie drummer couldn't even learn their craft and become a sort of wonderful drummer. This is what it sounded like. with sound technology um, that could replace musicians, not by any means. And another classic example, of course, was what they called the talky menace, um, sound in the cinema. And uh, this is a beautiful example from 1930, you know, sound film had been around for a while then. And what it shows on the front of the Musicians' Union magazine is a cinema returning to sanity because the dehumanised music, as they call it, the canned music's been put in the bin, and they're bringing in the flesh and blood orchestra. 
And that, that's what they did. They, they kind of said, well, these machines are clearly inferior because they're not flesh and blood. And it was not time for the Musicians' Union when these things happened because they'd always considered themselves rather unlike other artisans. But suddenly, because they were creating an artistic product and somehow they had felt, they, they spoke about feeling that they, they couldn't just be replaced by machines, and all of a sudden they were. Because of course they were like artisans in other industries where things like film sound, um, sound recording, and the drum machine came in, because suddenly their labour could be replicated um, by machines and all they had to do was get somebody to tend those machines. And of course, in the Industrial Revolution, this was something that was sort of gathering pace and was happening more and more. And of course, with automation, as people try to find more and more efficient ways, if you like, to make stuff, sort of, you know, the tailorization of the workplace, work became atomized. And sort of skilled jobs disappeared. And uh, people started to basically be just tending the machines almost like becoming robots, automaton, automata, just sort of tending these mighty engines of mass production. And of course there's a whole big story there, but relevant to my story is this. Uh, this is the work of Frank and William Gilbert. Some of you may have seen these. I'd love to build one of these, actually. This is their chronocyclograph. So what they've done is somebody here, I think she's making buttons or some such thing, and um, what they do is they have flashing lights on the wrists and then they do a long exposure. And, then, and what they were trying to do was they were trying to make humans into machine ideals. So this was around 1910. And what they were trying to do was iron out all these kinks that a machine wouldn't make. All the stuff they called wasted motion because they were trying to get people more happiness in it and obviously get them more efficient on the production line. And of course, today, Automation is everywhere, isn't it? And to the point where when we actually see hand, handmade stuff, we put it in our couture houses, in our museums, you know, we charge extra for it. And similarly, I'd argue that we live in the era of transmitted music, as everybody says. For many people, hearing live music is the exception to the norm now. And for many musicians, myself included, sometimes it's quite hard to know how to render something live when we're used to sort of presenting it in this sort of transmitted, duplicated form. And just like that drummer, just like the drummer could distinguish themselves from the drum machine with the sort of kinks in rhythm, it's these kind of kinks, isn't it, that we look for when we buy things to sort of reassure us that there's been some sort of human agency at work. And, and I, I find all this sort of stuff fascinating as a musician because I think, well, what am I? Am I the factory owner? You know, buying all this kit that I can get my hands on to, to make music, or am I the artisan? I think I'm sort of somewhere between the two, as are many of my friends. But um, a few years back, I was talking about this to a friend in the kitchen of my house. My friend Caroline is a performer and a theatre historian. She's a clock dancer. And she said, uh, well, yeah, she said, w would you like to work with me? All this stuff you've been saying is really relevant. Would you like to work with me on a new theatre piece? I said, oh, yes. And she said, yeah, it's, uh, it's clock dancing. <laughs> Um, this is what Carolyn told me. 
as you all know, clogs were the working shoes of people in the mills. And the machinery was a dance that evolved in the mill itself. It was devised by the women working in these incredibly cramped conditions in the mill. And what they were doing is that they were closely mimicking the actions and the sounds of the machines themselves. And this was in 1824, the earliest known uh, record of the machinery, this dance. And it's been passed down, passed down, passed down through the middle workers, and then through somebody called Pat Tracy, who sadly now died. She was like the, the last in the line. And it's machine music from the steam-powered age. And um, obviously in the mill, so what we did, just to cut a long story short, I said, this is great. Let's go to a mill. We went to Quarry Bank Mill on the Cheshire Lancashire border. And we made close-up sound recordings and visual recordings of all the machines. And every one of these machines, like the governor and the mule, have associated steps. And I thought, let's get rid of the accordions. Let's get rid of this sort of pastoral stuff. Let's put the machine, the, 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 the dance, back in context with the record of the machines themselves. And ultimately, we want to perform it in the mill itself. And um, it was an astounding visit to Quarry Bank because um, we got to see the machines that these women worked in. And when we were there, they could only run a small percentage of them for health and safety reasons. But even that was incredible. The sort of sheer noise and the sort of metric quality of the sound. And here, here, here's just a few of them layered up. So if you imagine, that was like a tiny percentage of the machines they could run, and these were running all day long. These women couldn't move, they couldn't lose pace with the machine, or they'd lose their jobs, or worse. All they, could, they couldn't speak to one another, all they could do was stamp their feet, and that was their form of expression. And it was a highly virtuosic thing, it became very competitive. The women sort of vied to be the person that could do the closest mimic of all the different bits of the machine, the shunts and the bloom and the mule and all of this. And um, then they took it to free and easy. They actually took it outside their workplace and took it to these places called the free and easy, where they'd show off a bit like wrestlers would wrestle for belts. They would do the machinery for belts. <laughs> about dehumanisation and everything we think about today and it was um, it just felt completely ahead of its time in a way that um, I still find astounding and of course it also felt very familiar as somebody who's into electronic music culture it felt very familiar obviously it was Gilbrithian there was no wasted motion but of course there were some other sort of familiar things in there that put me in mind of stuff like this <laughs> and I always think this is very good with him, by the way. automaton 
which I think the women would have found very interesting. But of course, it was embraced rather like the film sound. It was embraced not because it was a copy, but because it was an interesting something other. And particularly when more compact machines like the famous TR-808 came along, which were beloved of the early um, um, electro and techno generation. And of course, where was one of the wellsprings of that? Once again, in the factory. Here is um, a picture of a Detroit factory, a modern one. This is obviously probably itself now gone, but this is a this is a factory using um, uh, robots. But of course, 50, 60 years ago, it was a factory, a production line of people. I mean, Detroit automation. Automation was born. The production line of this kind was born in, in Detroit. And what came out of that? Well, once again, musicians couldn't help coalescing with the machines around them and creating music that reflected their environment. I mean, if you listen to early uh, techno, things like Cybertron. Cybertron sounds like the factory, and it sounds like it's talking about the cars of the factory. <coughs> the Detroit techno people and the Lancashire Mill techno women. And uh, where the women had the free and easies, they had things like the jit, all these dances that were like competitive dances where you know you wanted to be the sort of top <coughs> gang or whatever who had the best moves. And you know this could have been happening in a free and easy. <laughs> where they've been almost subsumed by the machines around them and they've created something wonderful that's coalescing with and embracing their coalescing with the machines and embracing their dehumanisation. And so I keep wondering, is it happening anywhere else? And there's a beautiful example. Um, is it Rob Lysett who was here earlier? I'm not very good on names. He just told me a brilliant example where on Saturday night in um, <coughs> oh, it was a, it was a I have to get him to write this down. It was a department store in Birmingham. Every Saturday night, all the till rolls would be emptied, and they all used to create this wonderful sort of phasing, dancey effect, and all the women on the tills used to get up and dance, and it was like this ritual they did every Saturday night, because obviously they were sort of deem more happy, and they danced to the very tills that they were listening to all day long. And I wondered if it's been happening, for example, in the call centres, which of course have been described as the dark satanic mills of our times, so that every moment of your time tends to be monitored. Interestingly, I just want to say about the call centres, some very spooky associations between the call centres life and the mill life, because of course, as I'm sure many of you know around here, many of the call centres have opened in sites of former mills. And if you think about the history of the cotton mills and the cotton trade, uh, at the early, you know, turn of the 20th century, um, the big network of the time was of course the shipping network, the container ship network later on, and that was exploited to send the cotton trade out of the country to other countries. And what we've got now, we've got the big network of the time, the internet, and similarly the call centres are sort of moving outside the country. And I think it's very, very interesting the way um, communications technology has sort of created the same transition twice. So I hope you find that interesting. I mean, I'm fascinated by this dance that was, it, it kind of felt like an act of defiance, but at the same time, an act of sort of a coalescence, let's say, with the machines. And I hope you'd agree that not only is somebody like um, uh, Daphne Oram uh, a pioneer, but of course, she shouldn't be alone. And perhaps these women also deserve a place. Thank you very much. Sarah.
<laughs> no Christmas at all? Really? Really? A question. Sabbath said something very similar about the yes. sound of the machinery. So what, what are the things that, that make different kinds of music based on the fact of the work or environmental uh, conditions? If that makes any sense. Why does it express itself as techno music in one place and heavy metal in another? <coughs> well, I think both, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think of both types of music, both um, expressing the, the machine sound, and in both cases, it's. I mean, so it's obviously with the with the foundry. I mean, funny enough, I used to do audiology with some of the ex foundry workers around that way, and I mean, the foundry was incredibly loud, wasn't it? And then you've got heavy metal, which loudness is a prerequisite. And similarly, with these machines, these were very metric, and, and, and the metric quality is a prerequisite. And I don't know, but I, th I just think that whatever environment you put people in, you know, whether it's Warren Williams on a hillside or, you know, some 1980s musicians in a factory, it's almost like it's a huge, it's the part of the human condition that you will find, like the women in the, with the tills the other day, it's part of the human condition that you will try, you will hear patterns, you will hear patterns in it. And it's a sort of, it's a way that people almost seem to be, I don't know how to describe it, confirming their own individuality and identity in a place when actually it's not really possible to do so. But I do think it's very interesting about the, the fact that the, the heavy metal stuff's coming out of the foundry areas, you know. Okay. Oh, we have more questions, excellent. So I, I was very into the electronic music scene from Sheffield in the 80s. Oh, I yes. think that was influenced by the, the kind of steel city, the uh, steel industry. Well, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Uh, Certainly, you know, some of the sounds which are used in the, you know, the music there are reminiscent of some of the sounds from the steel house. Yes, yeah. And, and it could just be a function of the technology. You know, you've got a noise making device here, you've got a noise making device there. But, um, yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think the environment, you know, it's, it's good, you're going to be, you're going to habituate to your environment, you're going to adapt to your environment, and it's going to come out in the music, I think. Yeah, um, so electronic music seems to have been very based upon um, strict rhythms, which is, uh, you're talking about machine-based rhythms. No, dance music, not electronic music. Sorry, dance music, yeah, yeah, dance yeah, music, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a point, obviously, because a lot of that is based on uh, restrictions as well in the technology. Yes. In that you, uh, do you think that we're getting to a point where dance music, or what are your thoughts on dance music taking on things like AI technology to actually learn to replicate <laughs> the, uh, you know, differences with music, like with musicians, the, uh, uh, imperfections. Yeah, well, you see, I, I do work a little bit with generative stuff, and I'm still a bit of a skeptic, and I do work a little bit with those sort of technologies. I'm still a bit of a skeptic because I think there's a gulf that exists between, um, how do I describe it, analysis and music, unfortunately. But I think it's very quantum area. What I would say is that Dan's in the room, and he works in that area, and he probably has quite a lot more to say than I do on that. What do you think? Oh God, it's too much to say. Keep down the mic, keep down the mic. Because Dan actually researches in that area. Thank you. Well, I suppose there's, there's so much, like, uh, in terms of analysing the, the structure of the, the natural things that musicians do, yeah, that, that's, that is taking place, and then you end up with things like, for example, the vocaloid voice and so you know, which uses a lot of the tiny little details of some singer somewhere to create the synthetic stuff. But then again, 
people take that te technology and take it to the unnatural extremes that it's capable of, and they produce this weird cult of their music. So, <coughs> it, whatever you give people, it, it goes somewhere else. Yes, because it's like artificial life doesn't have to be the life as we know it, does it? It can in the same sort of way. And what I say is that sometimes that stuff sort of verges into the uncanny because your brain is shouting at you that there's something inhuman about it, that it has certain human attributes. So it's a classic thing of the familiar taking on an unfamiliar form. You know it's wrong and you can't quite say why. Also, I'm really keen to hear a compelling generative performance. And you know, I'm sort of part of the generative project you now. I'm interested in it, but I'm, I'm not, I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> and I certainly haven't made it yet. I'm not saying it's not out there. Have you heard my performances? <laughs> <laughs> um, the internet. Uh, first of all, what noise does it make? Um, but also, with, with people, with, with so much feedback, so much instant feedback and feeling of itself, what, what does that lead to in music? Uh, if, if everybody has instant recognition and then, uh, you know, her, uh, for my day, you know, it was, it was wait till the vinyl comes out uh, in the record shop and uh, they're all going to sound the same for the next two months. I mean, there are two different things there. I think what the internet sounds like, I find it quite moot because there's this whole big thing about big data, and it's all very interesting. But um, I suppose what's what, what's interesting from a, from my it's all personal taste, but my taste with music, probably because I have an interest in cybernetics and such like, is I'm interested in music that's, that's in the real that's responding in real time, and where you have a sort of you know sensing actuating loop that's happening in real time. And at the moment, we can't really do that particularly well on the internet. So I'm not interested in, you know, big data solidified and things like that. And I haven't seen any very interesting <coughs> examples of, because the technology's not quite there yet. Right, like people synthesise tweets, so, make you, generative compositions from like... They can know, do it, but as, as somebody said, just because it makes music doesn't mean it's successful, does it? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> no, no, I said, yeah, you can do it. The technology's there to do it, but... It's, where, it's just personal taste, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm interested in emotional, my interest is in emotional contagion, but obviously there's a lot of emotional contagion in dance, and for me, emotional contagion is about, it's a multimodal thing where it's about how sound and an action and everything sort of combine to where the emotion of one performer sort of can flood a room, and I'm sort of interested in that, and I'm finding that quite hard to get on the internet, I'm not saying it can't be done. But I'm finding it quite hard to get on the internet. And in terms of, um, I, I think it's great the fact that anybody can put anything out there at the moment. It's sort of quite an enabling technology because you haven't got the same gatekeepers. But what's sad is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to see how any musician can make a, a buck now. You know, everybody knows that nobody can, you know, unless you're incredibly well known, you're not going to sell more than 300 albums these days. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to make a buck. But at the same time, it's wonderful that you know, if you're doing very niche music, which I certainly am, uh, people can get to hear it who it's into that same niche. It's like the people in this room today. It's the same principle, isn't it? How you have a niche interest and all come together for one new bites or whatever. Yeah. Do you reckon the. Have you heard the data um, <laughs> uh, um, centre that's been converted to uh, the, the data that comes off the network and um, server load and memory uses and stuff being converted to, to sound so that someone's uh, mapped the, uh, the usage over over a day yes. of, of network usage and memory. Yes, I mean, see, that's a useful utility thing, as in, you know, it could be an ambient thing. Has it, that sort of thing has a use? Yeah, it, yeah. Um, besides that, he's made music, it's just right. a particular fact, he's made the Yes. Track. Yeah, and I think, I think that's interesting, and I can see that it's an interesting thing to do. And all I'm saying is that for me, it doesn't quite do it for me yet. And I think it's, again, I think it's lacking the real timeness of, a, of, a, of an expressive performer. And it's not that I'm a sort of biological chauvinist, it's just that at the moment, <laughs> nobody's quite got there. I can't explain it. I just, it's just what I feel. It's just as a musician, it's what I feel. I haven't 
you know, and obviously the drum machine doesn't want real time, and that's the sort of beauty of it, it's a sort of wonderful constraint, you know. <coughs> Have you seen um, these apps that can make the world musical while you listen to them? Like, you know, Elder oh, which is yes, yes. Thing, which is people don't know it's um it's it tunes the world so it puts things in a key while you're walking around and it's like you're just listening to sound but then it samples them live so you can make noises and it'll repeat them and just by that repetition it becomes musical and there's a very we, we tried it um in the street and we we're just walking down the street with the headphones on us like, that's amazing and you take the headphones off and it's kind of the world is so much worse. Yes. Just, like, live music. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah and that's a lovely thing, you know. And that's, that's kind of a live... Because she she's got synesthesia, and she was like, this is how I experience the world all the time, is this musical place. So she kind of developed this app to share this experience. It was quite lovely. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Have you tried it? it I have tried one like it. I've got the name of it now. But yeah, I noticed it. Yeah, it's very interesting, that, because, as I say, it's, it's got the real timeless. You've got the cause and effect. I don't think it has to be like the world has to be Mickey Mouse, doesn't it? But it's sort of like you have to have a sense of, at least some sense of, I did this and the world did that. And I think if that's missing, and that's what's hard, quite hard to get on the internet at the moment, in real time, then I tend to switch off. It is down to personal taste, you know.